Hello and welcome back once again to The Single Malt Review. I'm Tim and today I will be taking a very quick look at something from Ben Reik. Something just a wee bit different, especially for a space side distillery like this one. This is the Ben Reik 17 year old Sepin Decken or Sepin Decken depending on how one likes to pronounce their Latin. It doesn't really matter, it just means 17. So um, whatever Ben Reik. Back to the drawing board, maybe with these Latin names. I mean, I suppose they're entertaining, but who cares, really? Um, Sepin Deckham, 17 year old, and what makes this one different, and what makes this one one of my favourite whiskies that I've had in the past wee while, is the fact that it's a peated, a peated space sign. And it's fascinating for another reason, and that this has this remarkable little stamp here. Um, no, it's in fact around here. Aha! Benrick floor maltings. So the implication here, and I wasn't able to find any hard data, if anyone does know of any then please let me know in the comments, the implication here is that this was malted independently at Benrick, and that's none too common these days. Of course Springbank still does it, some distilleries will do half and half, but it is very very rare to get a maltings out of a distillery itself with their own malting floors. Uh, which is sad, really. The old pagoda top roof, such an icon of the distillery, um, is so ornamental these days because they're the, um, effectively the chimney uh, for the malting floor and um, although they are sported and significantly lauded even by a great many famous distilleries, very few of them are used because the uh, malting floors are usually the, um, well, the visitor centre is the favourite um, as to what they've been converted into for a great many places. Um, floor maltings and independent maltings in the distillery are something that have fallen by the wayside. And I suspect, I suspect, and a great many people I think would agree, that a lot of distillery character there that way goes. Um, so sad, really, but understandable given that the, um, the demand for uh, whiskey these days probably far far outstrips any little floor maltings you really you need you need the throughput that the factories provide these days but but something was lost in the transition so here we have something quite special for Ben Reik mm. which just a bit of information on the company Ben Reik distilling company as most people will know started with Ben Reik acquired in a stroke of genius, a lot of people would say, Glendronic, and quite a lot of older Glendronic stock along with it, and subsequently Glenglasser, which has um, yet to really bear matured fruit, but it certainly looks promising, um, depending, on, depending on how you like your whiskey. Promising young whiskey, at any rate. Uh, recently, though, acquired by Brown Foreman, and I don't really know what to think about that. Brown Foreman, obviously, um, old-time bourbon people. They're uh, they're the Woodford Reserve and the uh, ooh, what is it? Mm, possibly the most common Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. That's who the people they are. They are the Jack dudes over there in the U.S. And they have acquired the Ben Reik Distilling Company, and that was a bit surprising for me. It's not new news. I think this happened. Oh, back in April or so this year, well, last year, this year. I'm still not really with the 2017 thing. Um, and I really don't know why. Uh, ben Reag, I thought, would have been a uh, wildly successful company given how popular uh, the Glendronic whiskies are almost on their own. Um, the Ben Reag never been, never had quite that, um, quite that cult thing that Glendronic always had going for it. But I'm certain that that was doing okay for itself on its own. Who knows, maybe um, maybe the owners just got a bit um, tired of running the whole thing and thought they'd, thought they'd done their bit. Um, nothing wrong with Brown Foreman, of course, as a company. They, uh, they maintain, their, uh, maintain their suite of brands fairly professionally, so I wouldn't expect to see anything drastic happen to the Clendronic and Ben Reik uh, ranges. I mean, inevitably these smaller companies do get sort of gobbled up by the bigger ones but it usually usually not to any great um, great detriment so hopefully the independent streak of the Ben Reik brand will uh, will live on we can but hope at any rate it certainly lives on with this one 17 years old 46 percent uncolored unchill filtered music to the ears of any uh, whiskey enthusiast 
And taking all that on board, it looks extremely promising. That is a beautiful, beautiful golden colour, which really, really sings out of nice, active bourbon casks. And they can produce some stunning whiskey, especially if it's peated. Where the peated malt came from, or rather where it was, where it was peated, um, I'm not absolutely sure. If it was itself peated on the malting floor, then we're looking at some really custom stuff. Um, the next question to ask after that would be, where did the actual, where was the peat cut? And I know on the mainland, who knows? Maybe we'll find out if my if my whiskey science is up to the task. From the nose, my guess would be mainland. This has a slightly Ardmoreish quality to it, um, which is both a uh, slightly awful Moorish pun, and um, more importantly, it's a distinct taste of mainland peat that really manifests in only one place, which is Ardmore, which we should really look at more of on the channel because Ardmore is a fascinating, fascinating distillery. It's fascinating whiskey, the only mainland peated whiskey. It's astonishing that it exists. I know I'm glad that they've. Um, kind of revamped the range, they really should be on export of call for um, a good uh, expose if we're ever going to do one. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. But enough about Ardmore. This one, Ben Reik, is really almost instantly promising. It's not wildly peated. I'm not sure if it has the PPMs. It doesn't, but I would place it. I would place it between something modestly peated like, say, Bunnerhaven, um, and maybe something a little bit more, like a Bowmore. Um, maybe more towards the Bowmore end of the spectrum, because uh, Bunnerhaven these days is very, very lightly peated. So it's not as peaty as you might expect from an Isla whiskey, but it's certainly, it is peaty enough, that's for sure. You would never mistake it. But along with that peat comes tremendous, tremendous sweetness. And... It's a really surprisingly juicy, almost dripping sweetness that comes along. Additional to that, there is quite a lot of sweet, polished leather. A really, really sort of well looked after, well looked after saddle or something. You know, recently, uh, recently oiled kind of a thing. There's a little bit of linseed on the nose, maybe more than a little. And that kind of makes me, it brings to mind the leather thing. It's almost like a linseed varnished wood going on. Quite, quite distinctive when you're familiar with the particular aroma. Very, very promising on the nose. And on the palate, again, a really, really tremendous balance of peat and sweet Speyside flavours. You don't think of Speyside whiskey typically as something that would benefit from the full peating treatment, but it actually goes quite well if it's done carefully like this is. There's the apples and pears from the sort of core Speyside qualities, and they on their own would clash with this smoke, but because it is old as it is, and it is quite old, most um, experimental peated expressions are knocked off either very young, sort of 10 years old, or booted straight out the door without, a no, without an age statement at all. Um, it's far, far more common. To see one after a full 17 years is really quite remarkable that they bothered holding on to it for that long, um, especially because I did not pay an extreme sum of money for this whiskey. This is one of the... Um, more affordable ones we've seen recently for for its age certainly so it's a um, it's a really uh, worthwhile experiment that I think they've done and quite a generous experiment too considering mm, but that age has really brought the spectrum closer to nuts sort of roasted nuts and quite a lot of honey to go with it and not the light heather honey that you normally see in space sides it's a darker honey it's what down here in New Zealand we would call bush honey, um, which probably means very little um, elsewhere in the world. When we say bush down here, we mean a uh, more of a forested area, not um, 
not honey that has come from a flowering bush, which now that I say it out loud, that probably is exactly what it sounds like internationally, but never mind. Bush honey, honey that has come from a diverse range of plants, not meadows, not clover, so it's a darker, fuller quality to it, and that's really what this one speaks of. Mm, and it's those two things, these roasted nuts and that darker, rich honey, they really, really bind and meld with that peat in a really tremendous way, such that the apples and pears can kind of happen, they can kind of happen around the edges in a sort of a strange ethereal way and themselves not get too bogged down in these heavier flavours. They're, um, they're the heavy syrup and nuts and the peat sort of frames one another and then you get these lighter space side characteristics just around the periphery. And it all, it's difficult to really describe. You're getting a bit synesthetic trying to describe um, flavors in terms of visual metaphors, but um, it won't stop me trying to do it. Needless to say, it's a complex whiskey. And it's a whiskey you can have a great deal of thought about as you drink it, which um, I, I like and I don't. Depends what I'm in the mood for. If there's a whiskey you want to sort of sit down and have a proper conversation about, it's pretty Davis in here actually. Um, this is this is one to do it because this is one that will speak to different people multiple different ways. And um, in that it's quite, quite special because um, you can enjoy it multiple different ways. You can as I say, you can you can have a sort of a, have a proper sit down tasting with this one, or if you're feeling really really naughty, um, and as a as a as a very naughty man myself, I might just put an ice cube in here and enjoy it on a hot day. It really is quite um, broad in its appeal. The finish is medium, verging on long, but there are there are longer finishes out there. And it ends up, it, there's probably the only one place this whiskey falls over. The peat um, takes just a little too long to dry up on the end of the palate and the, slight, the, the sweeter flavours diminish and you end up with a just a slightly bitter finish on it, like a bitter, mm, like a black tea or something to that effect. Uh, it's not, not as good as the rest of it, but that doesn't bring it down by a great deal. As far as what I would score this, this is really a damned, damned good whiskey. Uh, this is a 91 for me. This is a very, very strong, uh, strong release from Ben Rio. So I shall um, watch them with interest as usual. In fact, i am um, got a tasting coming up with the, uh, with the brand man from Ben Rio, so that should be quite interesting. Might bring you some tidbits from that one. Won't be able to smuggle any bottles out, sadly, but... Um, I guarantee I'll be able to see some pretty uh, outstanding stuff. Might do a wee post-tasting update, we'll see. Mm. But anyway, that was Ben Riek Sependecum, or Sependecum, depending. Uh, well, well recommended, I think, for uh, fans of almost anything. Fans of Ben Riek, fans of Satisfied, fans of Peter, fans, fans of Peter Whiskey. Fans of experimental whiskey, I think it really, really serves a great deal of people. Um, it really is one of the few bottles that I feel quite compelled to go and get another one, as this one is, as you can see, kind of flagging here. Um, so anyway, recommendation from me, take that as you will. Slander.